Hello, and welcome to the Adventures in Arting podcast, where we analyze, explore, and celebrate the creative journey. My name is Julie Fafan Balzer, and I am a working artist living outside of Boston. I've been hosting this podcast with my super special co-host and my mom, Eileen Schubalzer, since 2012. Hi, mom. Hello, Julie. So a couple of things of note, Design Bootcamp starts tomorrow, March 1st. Design Bootcamp is a workshop that changes your life, and that's not hyperbole. It's absolutely changed mine and dozens of students who have been through the course. There are tons of testimonials you can read on the website. Um, if you ever feel like you're floundering around in terms of how to make what you want to make or why something doesn't work, if you ever feel like you're not quite sure what your personal style is, which is actually the topic of today's podcast too, if you're looking for more confidence, then Design Bootcamp is for you, and you can find all the information about that uh, at juliebalzer.com. So like I said, today's episode um, is all about sort of personal style and self-knowledge. And, you know, I hear a lot of people constantly talking about how do you find your personal style? How do you create a personal style? How do you make a personal style? How do you find it? Whatever. And in my opinion, the single biggest key to your personal style is you right? You, you cannot separate you from your personal style. And so your knowledge of yourself and your understanding of how to put yourself into your art is the key to having a recognizable style. So if you're having trouble pinning down your style, perhaps the fact is you don't know who you are. And today we're going to talk a little bit about some things you can do to learn more about yourself, some exercises that you can think about, as well as some ways that you can take that knowledge into your work. I think it's really true that it's incredibly difficult to separate the artist from the artwork. If you go to any museum exhibit, one of the first things you see when you walk in is you'll see the life of, you know, X artist, or this is the period when he was living in Japan, and you can see how his work was influenced by that experience. I mean, the point is that you cannot hide sort of who you are, the experiences you've been through, all that kind of stuff. So before we started, as usual, mom told me that she had no idea what this podcast was about. She didn't understand the document I sent over. So let's see, mom, just with that little blurb, do you have a better sense of what we're going to be talking about today? Well, actually, just from what you've talked about in the last 60 seconds, I have a better idea. I do think that it doesn't just apply to art. I mean, if you think, if you look back at old pictures of yourself, everyone, you, you say to yourself, what was I thinking when I wore that, you know, or what was up with that haircut? I mean, I just think you evolve over time. There, There's fashion going on, but there's also self-knowledge and you have different ways of looking at yourself and you maybe not so much influenced anymore by certain things. Maybe all of a sudden now you're going for comfort as opposed to, uh, showing off everything you've got or so so i think the same thing goes in art you change what your influences are what your uh the materials that you're using and uh you figure out what what works for you but it takes time and it's ever evolving so yeah it's an ever moving target yeah it's exciting but i would also say like it, it is not just like, in my opinion, in art, it's not just that you have different materials or different techniques or different expertise. It, it, it is also a wider thing, which is you're maybe exposed to different looking things. You're exposed to different ideas. I mean, I have often thought that some of my crowded style of making art is based on the fact that, A, I mean, I lived in New York City for almost all of my 20s and 30s. And like, I, and also my personal style in my house is clutterific. Can we call that a thing? I like cr visually crowded spaces. They're a comforting thing to me to be sort of crowded in. I am not a like, why wide open spaces freak me out. I feel a little bit like in my cousin Vinny when Marissa Tomei and he are freaked out by the nature sounds at night as opposed to hearing like a lot of car sounds. And it is, some of that is just environment familiarity, what you're used to, and that shapes your aesthetic. So I think there are five key 
pillars to figuring out sort of who you are. So I'm going to kind of go through the pillars and then I'm going to give you an assignment at the end of it. So I hope you're talking to the listeners and not me. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know yourself? It's always a good question for reevaluation. And I do think that's another point, which is you, this is something that is is like a living document, a living idea. You have to sort of keep going into it. And this is part of the reason I think that artist statements need to be rewritten at least every six months because you are an ever evolving creature, right? I mean, so I, so, okay. I'm taking a side journey. We've literally just started and I'm already about to take a detour, but here's my very quick side quest story, which is I recently uh, took a class. It was a critique group, more than a class, I would say, but you had to apply to be in it and you had to indicate sort of like what you were thinking of bringing, but you had to apply six months before the group started. So I applied saying like, this is the work that I'm going to bring. And then by the time the group rolled around, it was a totally and completely different set of work that I ended up bringing because I was in a totally different place than I had been back then. And part of that is that I tend to work quickly, go through, you know, cycles quickly. Not everybody does, but I think we all, to a certain extent, change. Okay. That's my side quest. Let's get to the five pillars. I also want to just give the caveat and say, these are made up by me. This is not like, you know, God came down with tablets and said, these are the five pillars of discovering who you are. This is just, I made this up. Okay. So, uh, pillar number one is your values and beliefs. And these are the core principles and belief systems that guide decision-making and shape your worldview. So for some people, these are things that are religious, right? How to be good, or what is bad. For others, they could be social justice related. I'm the kind of person who gives to homeless people, supports black owned businesses, whatever it is, but they're very often passed down through your family. You know, you learn your values at home most of the time. Um, so for instance, it's really important to me that things are fair. Uh, and therefore, like one of the things I get super upset about and I have throughout my whole life is falsely accused. I cannot watch TV or movies with falsely. My mother will testify to this. I will turn off a movie. I will walk out of a theater. I cannot do falsely accused. And then to sort of extrapolate it a step further, like I actually think that this is part of the reason that I personally always want my paintings to be very balanced, very sort of equal, very sort of democratic is because I have this like, everything should be fair. Everything should be fair. It's like a value of mine. So it's it's an interesting thing about how I think it can roll into some of the way that you make art. Okay. So do you want to say anything about values and beliefs before we move on, Mom? No, but I will say that I think you've been changing lately and you've becoming you're becoming less equally balanced in all the different parts of a canvas, let's say. Mm -hmm which is actually to the good because you're starting to consider the whole canvas rather than each separate part. Uh, and it's, it's to the benefit of the art that you're producing. Again, in become, my opinion. Perhaps I've become less fair in my life as well. No, it's uh, just a, a question of whether you consider each part of the canvas a separate entity or whether you're seeing it more as a whole. It's almost like... Well, see, I would disagree like, with you. Well, too bad. So it's like <laughs> when you go and you try stuff on in a dressing room, whether you're going to mm -hmm. buy it, at a certain point in your life, you're only looking at like, how does it look around my neck, for example. But later you realize you can get a much better idea of how you look if you take a selfie of your whole body in the mirror. And then you look at that and you actually start to see things because you're looking at yourself as a whole rather than just this pair of earrings, this pin right here. And I think that works in art too, is that you're starting to back off a little and see the whole canvas rather than each part. So I disagree with you because I would say that part of the reason okay. that I find uh, like a lot of balance and like to have things very equally distributed is because I'm thinking of the whole canvas because I'm like so concerned that all parts are of the canvas are completely equal. And it is, it is learning actually to compartmentalize a little bit and to say like, this part can have this feeling and this part can have that feeling. And I don't have to consider the whole as much that actually, uh, 
you know, is sort of where I'm at right now. But I mean, that's also just another example of how all of our brains are wired differently and what works for one person in terms of an explanation of how to do something doesn't necessarily work for you. It's why it's so important, I think, to have, this is going to sound weird, but really uh, conversations with intelligent people who use a wide range of vocabulary. When we get stuck in using the same words constantly to describe what we're doing, it's very difficult to find a new path. But if somebody can use a word that's slightly different, slightly left, slightly, um, just slightly other than what you've heard before, I think it can inspire you and open new things up in you. And so uh, just one of the many reasons that it's important to talk about art, to talk about your process, to listen to people who talk about art, particularly people who are smart and use good vocabulary, because I think that that is very helpful. At least it has been for me. Okay. Uh, pillar number two is your interests and passions. So these are hobbies, activities, deep-seated interests that bring joy and fulfillment. So um, for instance, I like puzzles. I like reading. I really like romance novels. You might like history or biographies of famous people or, you know, fixing cars, like whatever it is that you enjoy doing, you know, our different interests and passions help to define who we are. So uh, if you're a person who like, let's say, loves bridges and knows everything about bridges and understands the mechanics of bridges. I don't, I, I think it would be hard to separate that passion and that knowledge from your artwork. And so I would suspect like, is there an engineering quality in your artwork? I do sometimes run into students who are uh, scientists or, you know, whatever. And you can see in their work that they attack the art with the same kind of precision that they might take into their other work. Whatever it is that you're passionate about and interested in, that's not a that's it's not a separate thing. It's like my 4-year-old keeps talking about his dessert belly. And that his dessert belly is not full, even though his dinner belly is full, which I think it's something we probably have all done. Uh, but he, by the way, seems to have an, a bottomless dessert belly. Um, but anyway, it's it's not like we don't have separate bellies, which you know, and I know, and he actually probably does know too. But we tend to somehow think of like the fact that I like skateboarding and rollerblading or that fitness is important to me is like a sidetrack, but it's not. It's integral to who you are. You know, I have a client um, who I was talking to about one of her artist statements. And one of the things that's really important to her is health. And she was sort of shutting it to the side. And I kept saying, no, 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 we need to talk about that. Because for you, like art is part of a whole health idea. And so it shines through in everything that you do, you know, and it, it, it is part of of the art. It is part of why you create. It is evident in the kind of um, things that excite you and interest you, you know? So I think it's important to center those interests and passions and not push them off in a little box on the side. Okay, pillar number three is relationships and social connections. So this is the good stuff and the bad stuff. This is family dynamics, friendships, romantic connections. Um, they all contribute to your identity, your sense of yourself. I, I cannot tell you the number of students um, who come to me who say, my family never believed in my art, or, you know, my husband thinks this is a waste of time, or uh, my mother was an artist and I always wish I was like her, but I'm not. Like your family, the people in your lives, you know, or even people who come to like membership as an online community because they say, I don't have any in real life friends who make art and I want friends who make art. You know, I totally get it. Um, and I also think there's even the ways that you define yourself. Like, do you define yourself as a wife, a mother? I mean, I see it in people's Instagram bios all the time, right? They write wife mother to this, whatever it is. And then also, or even in the, in the quote unquote olden days, when like you'd see a recipe by Mrs. John Smith, and she is defining uh, herself by her husband, you know, as much as anything. And, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, I am judging that. I was going to say, I'm not judging that, but I am judging that for a 2024 lens. Uh, but I think that the point is, however you define yourself definitely contributes to the kind of art 
that you make, you know? So it is, it's sort of two, it's more than one thing, right? There's the way that you define yourself defines a lot of the art that you make, but it's also your emotional connections with others influence your mood, your resilience, your emotional well being. Um, if you have people in your life who support your art making, you probably feel a lot more positively about it, a lot more free about it. If you have people in your life who don't, you probably work smaller, tighter. It's a more, you know what I mean, difficult situation because you're protective of it. And so, uh, that is, as I'm, I'm going to say that that is what it is. Sometimes you cannot change those facts or those people in your life. So it's instead of trying to, um, instead of being upset about it, it's time to embrace that and say, this is the kind of art that I make. This is where I am right now. I'm in my, this phase. It won't be like this forever, you know, but it will be like that for a while. I think that, um, you know, family shapes us. We even define ourselves as like, I'm a first daughter. I'm a, you know, middle child. And you could be 70. And that still is true and still has repercussions. So I think like that is a pillar of your identity in some way. So you do have to think about how you fit into the world. Now, mom, since we're both first daughters, have you any thoughts about this? Not the first daughter thing, because... I haven't devoted a ton of time to thinking about that, but I was thinking that uh, sometimes in order to do your art, you have to make a big break, which is very difficult to do because you have to go against a lot of other people's opinions about who you should be. And I was thinking of people like Gauguin, who just decided to stop being a bank teller and go off to Tahiti. Mm -hmm. and his paintings got sexual and colorful and mm -hmm. quote-unquote primitive looking i mean it's just it's how doodled in the, in the borders of his law ledgers that he was supposed to be keeping so it's like it's a question of how important is it to you to put your art making above everything else and i'm not saying you should I'm just saying it's hard. It's hard to make that big of a break. So. It is. And, and I, so I am, um, I'm not sure I totally, I understood it a little bit, but now that I have a child, I understand it more. The idea of seasons in your life. Right. Like I am just not in a season like where I could go to an artist retreat for four weeks or even two weeks or even probably one week. Like it would be tough to do which that. Which you have done in the past. Which I have done in the past and which has been great. And it never felt like a big deal to do it. But now in my life, I'm just, I'm not in that season. I need to be close to home, right? It's even like I try not to schedule things in the evenings because that is definitely family time, you know? Uh, and it's, it is a, I'm in a season. And I tell myself often when I'm having FOMO, or I feel like I'm missing out on things, or I feel like I'm just like falling behind everyone else who has this copious time. <laughs> Nobody has copious time. Um, but when I have those feelings, I just keep telling myself it's not forever, right? It's not forever. But the relationship I have with my child is defining a lot of the art that I'm making. It is defining the time that I have. It is defining, you know, sort of on and on and on. I mean, you even hear artists saying like, now that I have a child in the house, I don't like to work with oils or I don't like to work with chemicals or I don't, you know what I mean? Because you want to change that. Okay. Pillar number four is your experiences and memories. These are life events, milestones, and memories that shape your personal growth and narrative. I mean, they, they say this thing, right? That siblings grow up in different families. My brother and I are four and a half years, uh, you know, apart. But I think like sometimes when we talk about our childhood, we're both like, what? What are you talking about? And we obviously grew up in the same house with the same parents. So the experiences you've had, you know, are 100% unique to you, partially because of time. So there's four and a half years between us, but also even with like twins or kids who are real close in age, just because they have different personalities, they have different perspectives, they may be different genders, they may be who knows, just different in whatever ways. I And I was thinking too about like 
there are things that shape us and define who we are. I was I was listening to NPR in the car yesterday when I was going to pick up my son from um, preschool. And there was a woman talking about how a defining moment for her in becoming a doctor was when she was a little girl and a neighbor of hers was shot and killed in front of her. Ooh. And she literally, like, it's not like they took him away and he died elsewhere. Like, he was shot, she shot him shot, and he died there on the ground near her. And she said it was something that she would never forget, could never forget. And it it contributed in many ways to her wanting to become a doctor. And now I don't think anything that traumatic has happened to me, thank goodness. But I do think that there are defining moments in your life, experiences and things. And, and it is a little bit the Romy and Michelle's high school reunion thing where, you know, this one girl, the Janine Garofalo character views herself as having been kicked around all through high school and having been bullied. And then she shows up at the reunion and this girl is like, please don't be mean to me. You were always so mean to me in high school. And she's like, what? What? Right. Which is we only know our own experience of any situation. You never have anybody else's idea of what is going on. I still remember uh, a couple of years after I graduated high school, I was the nerdiest of nerds and, you know, just like a super good girl, straight arrow, you know, in my honors classes, doing drama club, you know, and chorus and like totally whatever. And this mother of uh, a girl who was a cheerleader who had been like a year or two below me. Uh, said something to me years uh, after we graduated about how I had been mean to her child. And I was like, what? What? Her, your child, the cheerleader who never spoke to me, that child? And it was so confusing to me. But then I was reminded that like everybody's sense of reality and what happened to them is so different. You just don't know. Something that's insignificant to you could be deeply meaningful to somebody else you know, and vice versa. It just is your personal experiences shape you. Okay. Uh, and I would also say like, I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna. I tend to be very much an optimist and, a you know, rosy glasses about everything and looking on the good side of everything. And my family definitely, um, has called me naive and like other things like that. But I also think like, I see that personality quirk that I just have that perspective comes through in my art in lots of ways that like I like joyful color I like things that make you you know feel happy or interested I'm not interested in doing dark art it doesn't interest me at this time to do anything that's like a deeply political even though there are a lot of social justice causes that are close to my heart you know I think who you are your experiences your memories your feelings like it does influence what you make it's okay. interesting because your brother in the times that he's done art, it's always weird, strange, depressing. Yes. And, and the you, movies, the films he makes and writes are very dark. Yeah. He's using art in a totally it's different way than I am. And even you, you write really dark poetry, you know. The house is creaking. Exactly. <laughs> I think, I think we all process things in different ways and through different ways and our attitudes come out that way, you know? Okay. Pillar number five, the final pillar here I'm saying is your skills and talents. So, uh, these are, so basically what's the difference between a skill and a talent? A skill is acquired. A talent is innate, right? You may have a ta natural talent for the piano, but you've acquired the skill of being able to play really well. Right. Okay. Um, and so then any strengths that contribute to your personal uniqueness. So you may not think that they're related. And so here's the story I'll tell. I think I've told it before. It's just such a good story. I can't not tell it again. There was a woman in design boot camp who was a retired nurse. Buying design boot camp was like her, one of her retirement gifts to herself, right? Good for her. Good for her. And I started to notice that all of the work that she would bring in contained some kind of vessel somewhere in it, a bowl, a cup, a pitcher, a vase. And I started to be like, you know, you've been a nurse for like 40 years or something. You know, you care for people. Like 
I don't think you, you like, I don't think it's conscious at all. And it wasn't talking to her, but I was like, you are the vessel you, or if you're not the vessel, like you're creating the vessel, you are interested in this idea of like caring for somebody, you know, and that is maybe it's an innate talent for her. Maybe it's an acquired skill. It's just certainly something that's just true from her life. Right. So the question is like, what are the hidden things or what are the things that you find, the motifs that you use over and over again? What are the, the skills and the talents that you have? Are you a really good singer? Is there something musical in your art? Because music is something that speaks to you, you know? Um, okay, so here is now the action that you can take. 25 minutes into this podcast, finally something useful for you. Uh, so here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. And this is going to take some time and I'm not going to lie about that. But I think if you do like maybe tackle uh, each of these questions, maybe one a day for a week, it'll take like 10 to 15 minutes. There's only five questions, but they're hard to answer because you have to really think it's not the writing part of this. That's hard as the thinking part of this, right? So the first one is what are your top three guiding beliefs or values? I want to say the three is an arbitrary number. If you can only think of two or it's really important for you to include five, like great. You know, I, three was like a basic idea that I had here, but it's just to get out and to say, you don't have to have a hundred of these. It doesn't have to be anything, but you know, are, is it like one, do no harm. Two, you know, like I have a friend who, uh, or I actually have several friends who always give to charity whenever they're asked. It may be a small amount, but it's like, that's just a guiding belief that they have, which is like, when you're asked to give, you give, you know? Point me to them because I have a lot of charities that I'm raising right? money for. It's good to do. Uh, you know, or is it a guiding, it could even be a guiding belief of yours, like I was saying earlier, that things should be fair. I just want things to be fair, whatever that means but it feels like things should be fair. And it drives me crazy when things aren't fair. Like when bad guys don't get punished and good guys don't get rewarded, it makes me crazy. Um, okay, so number two, what are longtime hobbies or passions of yours? And how about any newer ones? Now, why the difference between old and new? I think that everybody has new interests, but sometimes they you don't know until they've been around for a while whether they're really part of your DNA or if they're just kind of a fad. It's kind of like, are you wearing leopard print this season or is your entire wardrobe leopard and your living room rug and your couch and your pillows and your car interior and your baby clothes? And do you know what I mean? It's how, how much is it really like deeply in you? And I think if you have a long time hobby or passion, it's probably part of the core of you. And that's important to acknowledge. If it's something that you like have started, like I've started to play pickleball, but is that like at the core of you? If you think you're going to play pickleball for the next, you know, 30 years, then great. Pickleball can be part of your important identity. Um, number three, which relationships in your life help define who you are? And that's good and bad. So then the second part of that is why? So which relationships in your life help define who you are and why? There are some people who may be central to your life who did not define who you are. Like it may be, so I have what I call a late in life husband, right? I had the husband who I married in my 20s and got rid of him. And now I have the husband who I married in my 40s. And he is, I don't think he defines who I am. I was a fully formed person when I met him, as opposed to, I think when I met my first husband, I know, because I was 19 when I met him, that I was not a fully formed person. And so part of who he was defined who I was. But now I think I'm more of a fully defined person, defined person, and we both met each other. And instead of like defining each other, we just sort of, you know, combine, react, fit with each other is I guess what I would say is a better way of thinking about it. So just think about that. Which relationships in your life help define who you are? Uh, so four, what are some of the defining experiences you've had? And I apologize for using the word define so often, but it's an important word, right? What are some of the experiences that have made you who you are? This is like the story the woman had about seeing somebody shot in front of her. It could be the moment you knew you wanted to be an artist. It could be the opposite when somebody told you you couldn't. I think of Jennifer Grey with the watermelon in um, Dirty Dancing. 
when they, you know, carrying the watermelon and when, you know, up the stairs to the party. And then when they say that she can't do it, she's like, oh, I'm going to do it. You know, so was that a moment when it changed for you? Uh, what are some of the defining experiences you've had? Okay. And number five, what skills and talents are you proud of? So like, it may be true that you can curl your tongue into like 12 curls or something, but it's not like a skill or talent you're proud of. You might be. Uh, but so try to think of like the skills and talents that you're really proud of. What's something you've worked really, really hard for? Are you like an Excel, you know, champion and you can make any spreadsheet work for you and do exactly what you want? You know, are you a person who can, uh, you know, organize things really, really quick? I mean, like whatever that skill or talent is, whether it's art related or not, I think you need to write it down. Okay. So you've taken five days. You've answered these five questions. What are, what are you going to do with those answers? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at what you've written and you're going to think about how it might connect to your art. And one of the easiest ways to do that is take some of your artwork that you like, whether it's photos of it or the actual work, and put it next to the answers. And then what you're doing is you're trying to create a bridge. And if you can't do it yourself, you might have a trusted friend, a partner, even somebody on the internet, you know, a quick group, whoever it is that you can bring it to. And you can say like, can you help me connect these things with these things? If you find there are a lot of connections, you, there are now you're more conscious about it. Now you can exploit some of those things. Now you can become, you know, more, more clear about it. If you find there are not a lot of connections, you might not be putting enough of yourself into your work. And that's something to consider doing. Is, you know? is there a place for comparing your older work with your current work and then with these five sets of answers? Do you know yeah. what I mean? To see mm -hmm. if there's the seeds of things or how you've changed. I, I love that. That's the whole point of diaries, too, to me, is to be able to look back and see how you've grown, how the issues that you cared about have changed, how you've learned to deal with issues and problems. Yeah. And I think like this. Is, so this actually leads to my next point. Oh, I'll imagine. What a good segue, Mom. Thank you for doing that segue, which is the idea that self-discovery is a process and that, yes, like every six months, you could ask yourself these questions, but you can do some ongoing things to sort of keep self-awareness at the front of your mind so that as you make art, you are thinking about it. And one of the things about self-awareness is self-reflection, i.e. journaling, um, you know, writing down your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences regularly, because this can help you identify patterns and gain insights into your preferences. I mean, that's all that it is, right? Is and But the problem is it's you can't have to do more than just the writing. For years and years and years, I've just done the writing. The reviewing is part of the key because that's when you start to say, oh my gosh, I wrote about this six days out of the last 20. You know, and that can really be helpful. And I think um, if you're not a writer and a lot of people aren't, another way to do self-reflection is some kind of meditation. And I read a great thing the other day where somebody said, you don't have to sit still with your hands on your knees going "Om" to meditate. Like you can't, a meditation could be going for a walk by yourself in the woods. A meditation is just a time when you're letting your brain go. And it's not that your brain is totally empty during a meditation. It's just that you're taking that time to sort of process and be in your body, you know? And so that can be useful if you just have to take that time, you know, to reflect on your day. I, I would even argue that it's not a bad idea to lay in bed at the end of the day and to sort of review what happened in your day. This is a thought reflection. What are some things that you're thinking about? What are, you know, some thoughts that you're having and sort of fall asleep with all that stuff to process in your dreams. But again, I would say the one fall down of all that stuff is that you, if you're not writing it down, you don't have a way to review it to think about it, or you have to have a really good memory, which is something to think about. Um, another way to keep your self-awareness front of mind is to explore things. So this is like trying new things, being open to new experiences, attending events, taking classes, trying activities you haven't tried before, side quests, one of my favorites, 
just that's engaging in hobbies and activities that interest you, sports, arts, reading, cooking, whatever it is, like these things make you who you are. If you get interested in something, follow it. Don't have this mindset of like, I have blinders on, my hobby is art, I only make art, I am an art robot. Like you're not, you're a person and you're allowed to have lots of different interests. Um, exploring different cultures, traveling. There's that old quote about um, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page. I think getting out, even if it's just to a different city, a different town, a different a different public library than you normally go to, there is something about getting out. Sorry, what were you saying? Part of town. You don't yeah. have to leave your city limits if it's a big enough city. Yeah, it's just getting yourself into a slightly more uncomfortable experience allows you to have more self-awareness because now you're aware of like, how is this different? Why is this different? Why am I so comfortable in this other space and less so here? Do I like, so right now my four-year-old has a mohawk, like a serious mohawk, not like a faux hawk or anything, like it's a real mohawk. And as I was saying to my husband, I said, there are lots of kids that I wouldn't put a mohawk on because everywhere he goes now, people want to talk about his hair. They want to touch his hair. They want to talk to him like adults, children, the whole thing. Now he loves it because if, if he could get more attention somehow, I don't know how he could, but he wants it. He likes it. He loves being the center of attention. He loves talking to adults. Strangers are his favorite thing in the whole world. <laughs> so... Right. Yeah. So for him, it's a fabulous hairdo and it really is like a great thing. There are other children and adults who would die, who would die, who would melt into a hole and hate every moment of it. Right. And so I think like that is something that as he grows up, he's four, he has no self-awareness of any kind right now. But at some point as he grows up, he'll start to know, oh, a quirk of me is like, I like attention. I like to be the center of things, you know, and maybe I need to figure out how to harness that in a healthy way, you know, as opposed to an unhealthy one. Okay. Another way to keep self-awareness at your front of the mind is to question your assumptions. So this is challenging your beliefs. They could be beliefs about yourself. I'm not an artist. I can't draw. I'm not good at this. You know, whatever it is, like, are they truly your opinions or are they influenced by other people and what other people thought? You know, be open to changing perspectives as you grow. Um, I also think you have to have awareness. I'm going to say this. Yeah. Sometimes we think that if something is hard for us to do, it means we're not good at it, which I think is crazy because you couldn't walk when you were born and yet you stuck to it because it was worth it to you. I just think you have to be ready to be bad at things, to be a beginner at things before you figure out if it's for you or not for you. Yes, 100%. 100%. And I think that like, it's we use the walking metaphor all the time, but my son's been very interested in himself as a baby and wants to look at baby photos. And recently we've been talking to him about how he could not lift his head. For, he had this enormous head. He never crawled partially because the doctor... Uh, surmised it was because his head was so big and heavy that he just couldn't lift it. It took him forever to the rollover. If you put him on his tummy, he would lose his mind. He never did happy tummy time like other babies. He pretty much went from like laying on our laps to walking. <laughs> there was like no in between. He just wanted his head up. And like, we've just been talking to him about how you could not lift your head. It was too hard for you to lift your head. And if you think about that now, the idea that you couldn't lift your head, you know, but you had no choice on some level, but you had to do it. So like, if I told you, you had to draw to live life, guess what you'd be able to do at the end of a month? Well, baby, you'd be able to draw, you know, and I think the same is true with so many other skills like that. Okay, another way to question your assumptions is to seek feedback, ask others. Um, I see this all the time in some negative ways on social media where people say, what do you think of this or whatever? And people give varying useful uh, or not useful opinions. But also sometimes friends and family can provide insights into, um, does this say what I think it says is another way of putting it. Like sometimes it's nice to have a blind reader, meaning someone who hasn't read something before look at it and be like, okay, 
I don't understand what's happening here. And you'd be like, oh, that's because you haven't had 50 conversations with me about how this works. And now I need to write that part better. Or so for instance, I am working, I'm currently building a new community, an online classroom on a new platform. And I was like, I'm going to need some testers to go through here before I open this up because I just don't know what I know from having messed around with this versus how confused they're going to be coming into this new environment. And it has an app on your phone and how confusing that's going to be. So again, that's, they have pattern testers. They have all kinds of people with that. So sometimes people can help you figure out where you have blind spots about your assumptions in all sorts of ways. Um, being open to change. Listen, the moment we stop being open to change is the moment we get old. If you want to know the difference between an old person and a young person, it has nothing to do with the number, I think, and it has everything to do with your willingness to be open to change. And part of that comes back to challenging an assumption about yourself. I'm not good with technology. I can't understand computers. This is too hard for me, whatever it is. But listen, like, you need to grow and evolve. You need to embrace changes as part of your ongoing self-discovery. The world is going to change. The way that things have always been done is going to change. Um, I listened to, so I recently stopped blogging. I've talked about that before. It, it has been a huge event in my life because I've been blogging for so long and it's been such a part of my daily life. And it has changed the way that I communicate, the way I think of community. Like It has changed a lot of things for me. Um, and I listened to a podcast recently where these two women were talking about how they have been on their, their blog basically stagnated over the last decade. They have a huge blog, way bigger than mine. Um, and that they couldn't figure out why it couldn't grow anymore. And what they really realized is how much basically blogging had changed. And what I extrapolated from their podcast talking about the changes that they were making so that they're actually finally growing for the first time in 10 years is that when I when I started blogging, which is also when they started blogging, blogs were what they what the name sounds like. It was a log. It was just you talking about your life and people were interested in hearing about it. But social media, Instagram, all this stuff was really in its infancy and so blogs were where you went to do that. And so it was kind of like you could share whatever you did and people would read it and it would be useful. Blogs now exist much more as repositories for information that people want to find. So your blog, I'm looking for a recipe about peanut butter snickerdoodles. If I find your blog post about it, right, then you get the hit from it. You get the advertising money, maybe. You get the, maybe I could become an Instagram follower of yours because I, I like your recipe so much, whatever. But most people aren't reading blogs on the daily. They're using it more as a search engine. So they were talking about how basically what they've done is they've gone through their, you know, 15 years of archives of their blog. And they basically spent two years uh, keywording everything, rewriting things so that the the Google algorithms like their blog more. They have completely turned away from like craft and DIY because the things that people want are recipes of all kinds. They're doing, you know, like every kind of drink recipe, every kind of salad recipe, every, you know, just every kind of coffee recipe, just like those are the things that people are looking for and that they're seeing growth finally because of that. So it's a different game. You're now your own Wikipedia page or something like that. You know what I mean? You're creating like a mini wiki about whatever your area of expertise is and people just want the information. And when I started to think about how I access information, I was like, oh yeah, that's true. I don't really read a lot of blogs anymore. There's a five, maybe five of them that I do. What I do really is I like just go searching for information and then I'm in and I out. If I really like the person's work or something, I might follow them on Instagram or whatever. You know what I mean? Add them to my Pinterest page, et cetera, et cetera. No so, longer is people are no longer looking for a friend. Yes. For right. Blogs. You're not looking for a connection anymore. You have that through social. I think people, this is like how people blame Sesame Street for the time, like a lack of attention span that people have. But I think like a lot of times people are looking for a short form fix on Instagram for a seven second video or whatever it is. But part of, I think, 
my evolution as a human. And part of what I think is one of my strengths is that I am open to change. Like I recognize that blogging is just not the same as it was. It wasn't right for me. I cut my ties. I cut my losses, so to speak. And, you know, it was it. I'm embracing that change as part of my own, like ongoing self-discovery of what letting go of that can open up for me. Right. And it's also the same. I mean, this relates to sort of the last point here about questioning your assumptions, which is learning from experiences. So whether positive or negative, right. Experiences offer valuable lessons. So it's like, what did I learn from? Should I walk away? Should I not? I mean, there are thousands of people who subscribed to get my daily blog. And I know that you who are more conservative in some of the ways that you would run my business, you know, were like, should you walk away? Should you walk away? Should you walk away? And I was like, yes, I'm going to do it. And like the, really what I learned is that there has been no noticeable change other than the fact that I have more time and energy, uh, which is a wonderful positive change, like in the bottom line of my business basically has not changed at all, which has been a short period of time. So maybe that's not true, but it's been a really good learning for me and has changed one of my assumptions about my business and myself. Okay. Uh, I have, God, you guys, I, the problem now is that I'm actually really preparing for these podcasts the way that I would write my blog posts. So I just have pages and pages of things that I want to talk to you about. So another way to keep self-discovery at the forefront actually is making art. Okay. That actually is making art. And part of it is a little bit what you were talking about with like my brother making depressing paintings, which is kind of like art as a mirror right? It's reflecting sort of where you are right now. Maybe it's even like somewhere where you're just dumping some feelings so that you don't have to feel them so that you can put them elsewhere. Um, but I do think like when I, one of the things that drove me into art journaling for real out of scrapbooking into doing more than sort of surface pretty art was I was going through a terrible divorce. And I, I just, I didn't have the words and I didn't feel happy about things. And so it was a way that like colors and shapes and stuff could reflect the way that I was feeling at the time that I was able to sort of get it out that way. Um, I think art also, when you try new things in art, like new mediums or different styles and movements, like all of that can give you a lot of self-knowledge about who, who you are what you like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally, just remember with all of this stuff that you need to give yourself time. Uh, you need to be open-minded. You need to be kind to yourself, treat yourself like a friend and not like how you treat yourself. Like if your friend said the stuff that you say to yourself, like, you're no good, you suck. You'd be like, you're a bad friend, right? Or I hope you would. I hope you would say that to your friend. Um, Okay, so we're about to talk about how to translate all of this incredible self-knowledge you have, both from answering my five questions and also from like just keeping doing activities that keep self-knowledge at the front of your head. But before we move on, mom, do you have anything you'd like to add about this whole like self-knowledge thing about getting to know who you are and really thinking about it every day? I don't think I... Uh... I don't think I think about it every day. Maybe it's my age, you know, but uh, I do try to not always say, oh, I don't do that. That's not me. And that is why I'm about to take up skiing. Hmm, I thought you were going to say pole dancing. Uh, okay. So the same, the same distance from what I would do. More upper body strength, I think, required in pole dancing than in skiing. Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> okay, so how do you translate all of this incredible self-knowledge into something that's useful for your artwork? And, and to mom's point in terms about thinking about it every day, I think that, that there is a certain amount when you're trying to find your style and you're trying to figure out who you are that you have to do of kind of navel gazing of really like being introspective and thinking about it in order for it to be a conscious choice. It is, people are always looking for shortcuts. I'm not kidding you when I say this is a shortcut. You can just sort of blather on and like make art and make art and make art and make art and make art and, art and eventually sort of get there, or you can take a shortcut. 
which is you can take the time to really think about who you are, why you do the things you are do, what influenced you. And I think you'll start to see that some there will be some commonalities, com commonalities that will emerge. Okay, so that gets into how we're going to translate it. So you can take all the self-knowledge and you can turn it into personal iconography and or symbolic elements. That means like when I use circles in my abstract work, those are people. When I use dash lines, that's an indication of time passing. Doesn't mean that has to be true for you. You know, Chagall very famously was using a goat and a violin and a fish to represent, you know, different people in his life. Uh, abstract artist Julie Moretu has a whole series of symbols that she uses in her work that very much just look like um, to my untrained eye, like scrawls, but they're each individual marks that she uses. You know, can you find a way? This doesn't mean that your work has to have this personal iconography or symbolic elements, but it means that it could. That's one way. Um, another thing that you could do, and I find this really interesting because I don't think too much about emotion when I'm doing my work. It isn't at the front of my mind, but I have had some critiques where people have said to me, I wish we could see a little more of your emotion in your work. And I think that's, that is, uh, it's a valid ask, although unclear whether I want to do that. I'm not sure I always like seeing other people's emotions in their work, but that's separate. Too. Perhaps they felt that you're a seething inferno of roiling emotions. Could be, could be. Perhaps I am. Uh, so, Anyway, one of the things you can do is think about like how you want to express your emotions. Do you want to work through the sort of like sad period you're in? Do you want to work through the, your feelings of euphoria and happiness? Do you want to work through the idea that like things are chaotic for you right now or even, you know, have a painting that's part one and part the other? Um, you can explore personal narratives. So these could be literally the things you draw, paint, print, you know, however it is. These could be story paint. I mean, in some ways, Basquiat is basically a story painter. He's writing about the things he's seeing literally onto his work. He's, you know, drawing things that he knows. Um, in some ways, landscape painters are telling personal narratives, you know, of where they've traveled, if they're doing plein air painting or of things that are important to them. Um, you could you could share your unique perspective. You obviously see the world a particular way. Can you incorporate your perspective into your composition? So some of that could be like uh, so, somewhat silly or trivial stuff. Maybe you're very short, so everything is very tall to you. Or it could be something that is more like um, sometimes when I get on my high horse about the world is going to, you know, blank in a handbasket. Mom is like, I'm old. I've seen this before. The world goes through cycles. Everything will be fine. And so we have two different perspectives, you know, on the way that things are. And I think like that's important to put into your work. I think that your preferred art style contributes to the distinctiveness of your art. So maybe you have the self-knowledge, like I don't like abstract art. I don't like messy art. I, I like realistic, you know, real, whatever it is, like that is part of who you are as an artist and your taste is part of who you are and knowledge of your taste can only help you. I mean, the first exercise we do in design bootcamp is about your taste. Um, identifying your preferred techniques. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. So you can differentiate between your taste and your skill level. So oh, maybe yeah. your taste is realistic. You couldn't draw a cow to save your life. Right. But then what you know is like if everything you like is Goya, 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 he makes the most beautiful work. Then I'll be like, okay, well, you need to really sit and study how to draw, how to paint, light, shadows. Like you need to think about portraits, faces. You need to do like all the realistic art stuff. Whereas if you're like Helen Frankenthaler speaks to me in a way that nobody else does, I'm gonna be like, okay, well, we need to start talking about like staining canvas and we need to start looking through all the techniques you're doing. You need to go deep into color theory. You need to think about, you know, what shapes are unique to you. So again, your taste may not meet your skills and that's fine, but that's often also why we're frustrated beginners because our taste is better than our skills, but your taste dictates 
I think, what you might be interested in studying. And this is the thing I always say to people. If you love realistic portrait painting and you're just, quote, not good enough to do it, work on that. Fix it. It's not like, oh, no, I'm not good enough to do that. I can never do it. It's that you can't do it right now. But if you work towards it, you absolutely can. If you want to make flower paintings, go draw a thousand flowers. I have started back into my vessels, my motherhood vessels. Um, and as part of that exercise, I wrote to myself today in my studio log, Oh, I have it right here for those of you who are on YouTube. I can even prove it. Um, but I wrote to myself on my studio log, I was like, I need to practice drawing. I'll say it again. I need to practice drawing, right? I need to draw more still lifes because that's what I'm interested in right now. And I just need to be better at it. Break out the um, pears and bananas. Right? Exactly. I was like, how many weird bases do I have? Uh, so you need to identify your preferred techniques and mediums. That's also a taste thing because those methods become part of your artistic signature. They contribute to the uniqueness of your work. So like, um, do you love house paint? Do you love how house paint looks? That's now that's part of your signature. Are, are you, are you a pastel person? Pastels forever. You know, whatever it is, those things that you like, those become part of the signature of who you are. Uh, you will have to kill me to get the uh, China markers out of my cold, dead hands. Like, I, I feel like I cannot create without them, you know? They're one of my needed tools. And I think you can also explore materials and tools that hold personal significance. That's part of self-awareness, right? Do you like to use unconventional materials? Are you one of those people who makes brushes out of leaves? Are you, uh, do you have things that have personal meaning? Like there was an artist recently who was um, making art with things that were basically found in her grand, her dead grandmother's house. And it was like, what can you make out of this stuff? And then it's the whole idea of you're trying to add uniqueness to your artistic process. All of this self-knowledge basically empowers you to like infuse your work with personal meaning, right? It's um, allowing you to create artwork that's, it's not just that you want your artwork to be technically proficient, but you want it to be reflective of who you are. And I think the reason that so many people say that the key to finding your personal style is to make art is because that's true, but it's the making and making without any reflection that's not that useful. The key, as I said before, and the shortcut here is to make art and reflect. The R word is so important. And then you have to make a change because of that reflection. You can't just be like, oh, that's interesting. You then have to take that into the work somehow. Okay. So that's my, that's my sort of like big concluding thought about um, how you can use your self-knowledge to come out with your personal art style. So we have some listener mail from the last few podcasts that I thought we could just share. Um, there have been lots of great comments on YouTube. I picked a couple for each episode. So on episode 134, Reinventing Yourself, Christy said, thanks so much for continuing your podcast. I always enjoy hearing your thoughts, your willingness to reevaluate your art, your life, and what you will put energy into is inspiring and motivating. I look forward to your future podcast. So thanks so much, Christy. I appreciate that. And also, I think like that's a little bit about what we're talking about today is that you constantly do have to reevaluate your, yourself, your art, and to figure out what you're going to put energy into. Um, I picked two comments from uh, episode 135, which was the give and take of critique. The first is from Sandra. She says, this is a great topic. My husband is listening and he is understanding what a critic should be like. These are great tips. And I thought, that's fantastic, right? Good for you, Sandra. And I think, yes, listening to that podcast with the person in your life who maybe you ask about your art. So a child, a spouse, a friend can be really helpful because they can now understand what's useful to you. And then Estella had a tip on that podcast. She wrote, um, a few years ago, I learned a way to give feedback. It starts with, I like, then followed by, I wish, and finally, I wonder. So I like that, although I would get rid of, I wish, because I think that that's fine to say about your own work. I'm not sure I would ever say, I wish, to somebody else's piece. I might replace it with something like, I see. So you would say, I like the way that the you know, yellow touches the blue. I see a table with a fish and a vase. 
Uh, I wish there was more contrast so I could see the silverware more clearly. And maybe that then would be a series of useful feedback for the person. But it's a nice idea to sit, I have the idea, I like it, of having three things. So I'm going to say, I like, I see, I wonder. Uh, and finally, on episode 136, what is an art practice? Candace wrote, this was my first time listening. I love the rapport you have with your mom. This also gave me a great framework in developing my own practice. I usually go with whatever is inspiring me, but I have so many art forms I like to create in. I tend to lose focus, which is okay and sometimes desired. Building a framework or schedule that will allow this exploration and pairing with more technical or even mundane tasks like prepping services, cleaning a studio is a great way to maintain the habit of creating. Thank you so much for sharing your practice. It is truly inspiring. So I love that Candace, A, found something incredibly useful to take out of the podcast because that is always our goal. I really want the podcast to be, yes, entertaining and fun and you enjoy spending an hour with me and mom, but also I want them to be useful to you in your art explorations, in whatever you're, wherever you are in your art journey. And I also love that Candace is a new listener. Because, of course, if you want to help the podcast, you know what to do, which is need to write a review, tell a friend, because those are all the things that help the podcast. Um, and then a couple last things before we go. I mean, obviously, we always appreciate all of the comments that you guys leave. We do read them all or I read them and then pass them on to mom. Um, if you want more with me, you can check out monthly membership at ballsdesigns.com. Membership offers a diverse array of classes, tutorials, vlogs, and art inspiration. Um, my practical color for painters class is ongoing. If you want to study chemistry, you have to know, understand, and be able to use the periodic table. If you want to study art, you have to know, understand, and be able to use a color wheel. Um, so we're going to, it's more than a color wheel though. We go beyond that. We progress to creating your own personal palette of colors. The, um, comments that people have left already just from the first class have been absolutely fantastic. So I hope you'll check that out. Uh, and anyway, you can find me at juliebalzer.com or all over social media as Balzer Designs. I really hope you'll sign up for the free weekly newsletter. That's the best way to make sure you keep up on the latest news. There's a big button on the homepage of juliebalzer.com where you can do that. Or you can go to the show page for this podcast to find the link. So thank you so much for listening and subscribing. Mom, thanks for being here. We'll see you the next time on the Adventures in Arting podcast. Bye.